In this chapter, we want to talk about heat loss mechanisms. It's important to understand what's happening when you're either in cold air, but specifically in cold water. And uh, we can see our, uh, our boater here who's in cold water and maybe even looks like he's in ice. Uh, there are four major mechanisms for heat loss. The first one is radiation. And right now, when, there's not a, when it's not really cold, mo most of the heat that we are losing from our bodies of that 100 watts we talked about is just through radiation. We're just radiating heat away from our bodies. Another way that we can lose heat is through evaporation. When we sweat, which would be in the hot environment, or when our clothes or our skin gets wet because we're in water, the water evaporates and evaporation takes heat away from the skin or the clothing layer. Convection, most of us have heard about that. Convection relates to either when, when air is blowing across our skin or if we're in water and water is flowing across our skin. We normally warm up a boundary layer of air or water, whatever's next to the skin, and we expend energy warming that up. And if it's still air, then that air will stay warm. But if we have convective currents moving along, it moves that warm air or water away and we keep having to regenerate more heat to keep heating up that boundary layer. So that's why convection is so important. The final mechanism is conduction. And most of us understand that if you sit on a cold rock or on the bottom of a boat in cold water, you're just conducting heat away to what you are in contact with. And this, were, this is very important when we think about our activities, how to prevent heat loss. We, 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 we try to sit on a piece of insulation. We try to stay out of the wind. Uh, we try, as we might talk about later on, we, we want to not move through the water so much because that will all increase heat loss. So basically the body is trying to maintain homeostasis in temperature. In other words, keeping our body temperature at the same level throughout the day with some variation throughout the day. But our core temperature is a balance between heat loss and heat gain. So we've already talked about the fact that we lose heat through evaporation, radiation, uh, conduction and convection, and we balance that off with heat gain, which we can either do through heat production. Right now we are producing about 100 watts of heat. Uh, we could exercise to produce heat, or we can shiver to produce heat. So that increases our heat gain. And we can also gain some heat from the environment. In a cold water environment, there's not too much place to gain heat, but in a rewarming scenario, uh, when a rescuer might put a source of heat on our body, that's another way to gain heat. And again, we're trying to just shift, in a hypothermic victim, we're trying to shift the balance over to the heat gain so that we can increase core temperature. These are some interesting infrared pictures that show us how what we do can increase or decrease heat loss from the skin. Uh, in, in infrared, lighter mean heat loss or, or warmer skin and darker mean colder, which means vasoconstricted or areas of skin that are not losing heat. And this is a person at rest in room air and you can see basically there's kind of blood flow all over the chest and, and he's therefore obviously losing some heat. And this is a person who just went into very cold water and just sat there for a number of minutes and then came out. And you can see uh, a number of principles that are important for various topics. First of all, you see that basically most of them is a dark color, meaning that there's, it's cold and there's no heat loss, meaning there's not very much blood flow. But you have these areas here around the neck, sort of right over the heart, in the in lateral chest and in the groin that are light, which means that they're warm meaning that there are, uh, there's heat loss coming from that skin. And that's because these are areas where we have major blood vessels that are actually close to the skin and, uh, and we can lose or gain heat from those areas. It's important to keep this in mind when you're treating a hypothermic victim. If you're going to provide heat somewhere, what I normally tell people is really you should just apply the heat to the underarms and to the chest area because the neck is usually near an open uh, part of the sleeping bag or the, or the cocoon that you have the person in so a lot of that heat is lost and we really don't want to put uh, heat in the groin area because you can cause some injuries. This is a person who's now been in the water instead of resting he's been swimming. 
So he swam quite vigorously with his upper body. And, uh, and you can see a, a, a stark contrast. This, this area is, is very warm, meaning that there's a lot of blood flow there and a lot of heat loss. And this really comes into play when we talk about when you're in the water, what should you be doing? Should you be swimming or not? Um, obviously, uh, to perform swimming, you are getting blood flow to the muscles that, are, that, are, that you use to swim, increase blood flow, increase heat loss. And, uh, and indeed, we have done studies in the lab where people uh, start doing exercise, and very soon after they start that in cold water, their core temperature just starts to drop. To summarize, under cold conditions, the body normally causes vasoconstriction, which decreases heat loss, either conductively or convectively. But when we exercise, we force blood flow into the periphery, and we can greatly increase heat loss from the skin. So that's heat loss mechanisms. Are there any uh, questions that you might have? Well, you had mentioned in, in C, when a person exercises or is vigorously swimming, that it increases the, the heat production, but yet at the same time decreases the body core temperature. Yeah, this is, uh, this is one of those frustrating questions where the answer is it all depends. Indeed, you are producing heat, so that should be helping on the heat gain side, and that's, that's a good question. Uh, it, it, it depends on the temperature and it depends on how much exercise you do. So the colder the temperature of the water, the more likely exercise is to cause a decreased core temperature. And then at those colder temperatures, the more exercise you do, the more chance there is of decreasing core temperature. Now we have done some studies on people, and it is relevant for cold water uh, boot camp, people who have had survival suits on, dry suits, and we have shown that with them, if they did 15 minutes of exercise every hour in uh, several hour experiments, that actually helped because now the heat that they produced was being kept in by the insulation. But normally, if you do a lot of exercise in cold water, the balance is going to tilt to losing temperature. Uh, of the four mechanisms of heat loss, which is the most critical in a uh, cold water immersion situation? By far, conduction. Uh, water conducts heat away from the body about 25 times faster than air at the same temperature. So that's why even if we jump in water that's, that's much warmer than the air temperature, it feels colder because it conducts heat away. And uh, when, we, when you're, the average person might be in uh, uh, 40 degree water, they're probably losing 1600 watts of heat from the skin through conduction. It would increase a bit more if there was some water currents along the skin, but by far conduction. This slide shows, uh, shows us the high heat loss areas, neck, armpits, groin. doesn't say anything about the head. Is the head still considered a high heat loss area? That's a great question. Generally, people think that you lose more heat uh, per surface area of the head than anywhere else in the body, and the reality is you don't. Uh, we feel colder in our head because normally we've got clothing on the rest of our body. This misconception is very important because we know that people in cold water, some of them actually have thought that I am losing most of my heat through my head and have gone through all kinds of weird contortions to try and, and protect their head when their body is in freezing water. And the reality is they're losing 1600 watts from their body into the cold water and they might be losing uh, 80 or 100 watts from their head. So just think about what feels the coldest and that's where you're losing most of your heat from.